Good God. Wow. There's really no way. There's no way to control it. Okay, I'm going to give up and start. All right, so hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Let's see if we can get the show on the road. Those of you who were hoping that I would talk about forensic science today have been misled. That's not what I'm going to talk about. I'll talk about that um, uh, soon, not today. We've been talking about siblings and twins and uh, differences between children. And the question, of course, is how the hell do these children get made? So we do have to talk about uh, how humans pair up and um, why the heck are people attracted to each other? So that's the subject of today's class. We're gonna have important answers to the meaning of life questions that many of you have been craving to know for a long time. So let's go. So here we go. The question is, the topic is, how do women choose men. And the reason that's the topic is because the uh, alter alternative question, how do men choose women, is not very mysterious. There are many answers for that, and uh, researchers' answers have matched guesses that people previously had. So let's look at the more mysterious, difficult one. Um, uh, suppose you are in a crowded bar on 6th Street in Austin, Texas. It's noisy, it's full of people, it's annoying, um, it's crowded. And uh, you see a guy who seems to be uh, staring at somebody in the other side of the room. And it's a woman and she notices him. They make eye contact for what looks to you to be an uncomfortably long period of time and he slowly moves across the bar towards her uh, she keeps looking at him as he's walking and then they stand near one another uh, very close to each other and you can tell that there's there's something special going on there's something unusual going on something like a body language so they exchange pleasantries they share their Instagram profiles, and sure enough, a year later, they're married. So the question is, how the hell did this happen? Why was she attracted to that man? Why was he attracted to that woman? So if we're gonna talk about this biologically, one possible way to try to answer it is by looking at animals. How do animals choose one another? And one of the things that uh, Darwin talked about, of course, is uh, physical appearance. You look at a peacock, it has this extraordinary range of colorful, large feathers. And then we guess that the peahen is attracted to the, to the peacock because of these colorful feathers. But is it true? Is that what's actually happening? I mean, remember that uh, Darwin is a guy who's sitting at home with a stomach ache uh, for years, and uh, he's not doing experiments with birds or peacocks. So uh, more than a hundred years after he's thinking about this, finally some important experiments are finally done. Um, one of the things that um, is remarkable is this question about colorful birds. Um, a geneticist in uh, a Swedish geneticist in 1982 starts uh, analyzing or publishes results about what is known as female-driven sexual selection. Why are female birds choosing certain mates? And Malte focuses on these birds known as widow birds. 
here's an example of what one of them looks like. So it's an interesting looking bird with a, a you know, colorful sh shoulder, but what really matters is this long tail that is longer than its body. The question becomes why the heck does this particular animal have such a long tail? These tails seem to be a little bit inconvenient. They're something that the bird has to drag. Some of these tails are long. And um, if we had to guess, you know, what the heck is this tail used for? One possibility might be that the tail is used for fighting. Maybe the birds, uh, you know, use the tail to, to swap each other away. But observing these animals, they find, zoologists find that's not what the tails are used for. Apparently, th these tails have to do with sexual selection, namely um, a female bird, which in this case is the female widow bird, is this one uh, rather homely looking brownish plain bird. And then the male bird is this more colorful, exotic, impressive tail bird. And the conjecture, it's just a guess, like in the case of Darwin, is that the female bird is attracted to the male bird because of his feathers. What Malte Anderson does is he puts that to a test. In other words, we can simply experiment on this by taking some scissors and cutting off these, uh, ta these tail feathers. It's cruel, it's wrong, but you know, this is the way scientists are. They do uh, uh, awful things to animals that uh, probably would not be allowed with people. Cut off a bunch of tail feathers and now watch the behavior of the females to see if the females are attracted more or less to these individuals that have shorter tails. What Anderson finds, in fact, is the individuals who are male and have shortest tails are apparently unattractive to these females. Anderson goes a step further, which is, can we make the, uh, can we make the tails longer? Yes, we can take a bunch of the feathers that we cut off some of the birds, and we can attach these feathers to to some male birds. And we can also attach fake feathers to the male birds at the end of their tail. Do the female birds find this more attractive? The answer is yes, they find it more attractive. So the widow birds that have the spectacular long tails are more attractive to the female birds. So it seems to confirm that these traits are all about looks. Attraction here is about physical appearance. What about other animals? Again, the uh, female uh, peacock is known as the peahen and uh, has these rather drab, ordinary grayish colors and does not have these extraordinary feathers that we see on the male. Why, why the heck does the male, the peacock have these colorful displays that the females simply do not have? Why is that happening? As I said in one of the classes, it's happening because of the sexual selection. In one way, in evolutionary history, the females are doing this to the men. The females are discriminating so much, their standards are so high, that they're only mostly choosing males that have these interesting, even outlandish traits. So the more they choose generation after generation, according to Darwin, these creatures become more and more colorful. But again, this is just conjecture, it's just a guess. Until you actually clip these feathers off, you don't know if it's true. Sure enough, biologists have done it, zoologists have done it. They cut off the colorful feathers from the peacock and they find that the peahens are less attracted to the peacock then. They expand, they add to the feathers of the peacocks and they find that the peahens are more attracted. So it's this interesting thing about physical appearance. Um, animals are not just attracted to individuals, meaning uh, this bird is not just going to find this other bird attractive. She's going to find a bunch of other male birds also attracted 
So polygamy is very common in the animal world. It's extremely common. Uh, mammals are having sex with other mammals that they have not necessarily paired up with. Um, uh, reptiles are doing it. Um, in the mystery, when you think about how common it is, polygamy is so common in animals, the mystery is how come humans don't do it much in most states? How come humans don't have, uh, uh, you know, many spouses in most countries? How come? It's so common in the natural world, we could say, hey, it's just natural. That's just nature. That's the way to go. Let's all do it. In other words, why settle for one spouse when you can have 10? Why settle for a family of, uh, you know, man, woman, and two kids when you can have 20 women and five men and you can make, you know, 50 kids? Go forth and prosper. So it's a mystery. Why the hell are humans mostly monogamous? Among uh, animals, mammals are 97% polygamous. In other words, most mammal species are uh, having sex with uh, whatever comes along. Suppose we define polygamy um, uh, to mean mating with more than one animal. And suppose we define monogamy as mating with only one animal and no other animal ever. If we do that, then 100% of animals are polygamous. So we can't do that. We can't even do that. What we got to do is we have to come up with a working definition of monogamy so that we say, well, it's relatively monogamous. This animal kind of you know, sticks to one animal, cheating rarely. So if we do that to mean uh, monogamous is faithful most of the time, then uh, birds are 90% monogamous, 90%. Mammals are 3% monogamous. Primates like chimps, uh, orangutans, uh, gorillas, uh, etc., cetera, are 12% um, monogamous. And that 12% assumes that we're including humans amongst uh, primates. Uh, an interesting species is the uh, prairie vole. It's a kind of rodent, rodent that lives in uh, prairies. It's a small furry thing. These things are not monogamous. That is, they do have sex with multiple partners, but they are socially monogamous. That is, they do choose one partner that they have kids with and that they uh, kind of settle down for and that they, um, they sit with. They sit with this partner. Every now and then they go out and they have sex with someone else, but they sit with their partner and they raise their kids with their partner. So there's, one, there's a difference between being uh, sexually monogamous and being socially monogamous. Let's go back to the screen. So here we got this character, Charles Darwin, in uh, 1881. He has that uh, sheepish, sheepish, sad look about him. I don't know what it is about Darwin. I think he looked really sad in most of his uh, photographs, at least very late in life. He did have a daughter that he loved a, a hell of a lot, and she died young. So maybe there's some of that heartbreak in his eyes. I don't know. Darwin thinks about this question, the mystery of monogamy. Why the hell are humans monogamous when that's pretty rare in nature? And he looks at historical records of ancient societies, and he finds that in most ancient societies, Polygamy was relatively common. He writes, what ancient nation, as the same author asks, can be named that was originally monogamous? So he's saying, if we look to ancient times, humans apparently were not monogamous. In other words, monogamy is a relatively recent development 
in the history of humans. But still, we've got the mystery of attraction. Why the heck is one man attracted to one woman, or uh, one woman attracted to another woman, or a woman attracted to a man, and so forth? Why does that happen? Darwin writes, it cannot be supposed that male birds of paradise have beautiful feathers for no purpose. A girl sees a handsome man, and without observing whether his nose or whiskers are a tenth of an inch longer or shorter than some other man, she admires his appearance and says she will marry him. So I suppose with the peahen. So Darwin acknowledges that physical appearance must be very important in colorful birds like peacocks and birds of paradise. But he's also aware that there might be these other things, other factors that are invisible. One man can look nearly uh, the same as another, but yet he's not the one that is chosen by a particular woman. So why did the woman make that choice? What are the invisible signals that go beyond appearance? Which brings us to a biologist working more than a century later called Kunio Yamazaki. He is, uh, has a PhD from the University of Tokyo. Um, uh, he was working by this time in uh, Philadelphia and he's doing experiments with inbred lab mice in the early 1970s. And what he does that uh, sets him apart and gives him an unusual place in the history of science is he actually has the courage and the um, uh, pioneering cutting edge attitude to actually sniff the urine of the mice that he, <laughs> that he is experimenting with. So he finds that um, uh, these mice are doing this. These mice are sniffing each other's urine. Uh, these lab mice, the females are sniffing the urine of the males and, you know, they're having sex with one another. So he analyzes the biochemistry of the urine to try to find out how does the urine of this male mouse compare with the urine of the female mouse to see is there any similarity? Is there any difference? What he finds is that in the urine, there are these molecules that are very distinct for the individual mice. So here we've got these um, nasty looking little swarm of cuddly mice. Uh, sad but, but true, they do uh, sniff each other's urine. You know, they're bored. They don't have Instagram, they don't have uh, social media. So, you know, they do other things. They can't read a book. So they sniff each other's urine. And um, by analyzing the biochemistry of their urine, Yamazaki finds out that the MHC molecules, that is the major histocompatibility complex of these mice, is very different. In other words, it looks like the female mice are choosing males that have MHC molecules that are very different to their own. So uh, first of all, uh, what's histology? Histology is the branch of biology that studies organic tissues. That is, what is the microscopic structure of tissues such as cells, that's histology. Compatibility is a uh, self-evident word. Um, uh, complex just refers to the structure of this molecule. So um, imagine a cell, the cell has a wall. On the wall of that cell, interactions are mediated. That is, which substances are, are going to be allowed to enter the cell, which substances are going to be kept out some of these interactions are mediated by leukocytes, that is by white blood cells, and they're going to prevent certain things from getting into the cell. The MHC is the molecular structure that 
determines, decides which kinds of things are going to make it in. So what Kunio Yamazaki discovers to his eternal fame is that the female mice are most attracted to male mice that have very different MHC than their own. That's um, uh, that's what that's what he, that's what he discovers. So Yamazaki realizes that this might have implications for humans. In other words, what about us? Are we choosing people we like because of our smell or because of the way people stink? Maybe we don't like some people because of the way they stink. You know, you get close to someone, you thought you were gonna like them, suddenly you're very grossed out, you move away and you realize that they just smell bad to you and that that was the key thing. It wasn't some abstract factor, it was just maybe you didn't like their smell. Yamazaki proposes that there might be significant uses for these kinds of smells in the study of humans. For example, maybe we're going to be able to identify people who commit crimes on the basis of their smells. In other words, the MHCs can be so unique and so distinctive that you can use it as an identifier just as you can use a face or a fingerprint, etc. The big question is, does this uh, MHC business apply to human attraction? The experiments are finally done by someone else and his name is Klaus Wedekind. Does this apply to humans? That's the issue. That's the big mystery. That's the nasty one. Zoologist, Swiss zoologist at the University of Bern, the capital of Switzerland. He works on this in the early 1990s and carries out experiments with women and men. The experiment goes as follows. Ask college students to volunteer. Get 49 college women and 38 college men to participate in this experiment. The experiment is the following. He gives each of these 44 college male students a cotton t-shirt that he wants them to wear two nights when they're sleeping. So during the day, you know, you go do what you gotta do, but then when you come back at night, you put on the shirt. And I want you to do the following. Don't eat spicy foods. Don't wear deodorant. Don't wear cologne. Don't use perfume soap. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't have sex. And instead use this soap that I've given you. And I want you to eat the same foods. So these 44 men, these two days, eat the same foods and use the same odorless soap. After they sleep wearing these shirts, they uh, wear it uh, at night, a couple of nights, they deliver the shirt to Vedekind in a sealed plastic bag. Now Vedekind takes these shirts and he organizes a group of young women to smell the sweaty shirts. Each woman is put in a room by herself and she is given six t-shirts, sweaty t-shirts that she has to smell. And um, uh, the question is, do you like any of these smells? Is any of them kind of gross and unattractive to you? People already knew that apparently women's smell becomes more acute, more uh, sensitive during ovulation. So they're smelling these shirts and um, uh, the finding is that uh, Vedekind analyzes the uh, 
organic compounds in these shirts. That is, he analyzes the sweat from these men. And he finds that by comparing the MHC molecules, major histocompatibility complex molecules in these men to the MHC in the women, a similar thing has happened than what happened with the mice. Meaning the women like the male MHC if it's very different from her own. Not only do they like these different smells, they say that, uh, hey, I like this t-shirt because it reminds me of my ex-boyfriend. Or I like this t-shirt because it reminds me of my partner. So there seems to be an actual connection between the men that these women are selecting, in fact, for relationships and the, the sweat of these uh, t-shirts from these strangers. Now, I said that the ability to make these selections is connected to whether women are ovulating. So the, what that means experimentally is that their preferences in this kind of experiment have been shown to depend on their hormonal status. Specifically, suppose a woman is taking a birth control pill. A birth control pill tricks the body into thinking that the body is already pregnant, so the body is not going to get pregnant again. Um, uh, so the, the, the steroids simulate the status of pregnancy, and uh, now you give this woman this sweaty t-shirt that she has to smell. And what experimenters found is that women do not make the same selection. The pill is interfering with their previous natural ability to detect or identify certain kinds of mates that they find attractive. As I said, for Vedekind, this happens in 1995. His results are confirmed in 2005 by other experiments, confirming that there are genetic components in the odor of mates that are affecting who we like. So what's interesting about this, I uh, think it takes us back to Richard Dawkins, the selfish gene. Imagine that we really are puppets of these invisible microscopic entities called genes or segments of DNA code. Imagine that we're puppets and we're being used to, um, to replicate these puppeteers, to make copies of themselves. If that's the case, then they're getting us to like people without us even knowing why we like someone. We think we like such and such because that person is such a great uh, conversationalist and that person is so interested in the same books we like. But guess what? There's some other person that loves the books you like too and you don't want to talk to that person. And uh, there's someone else who actually gets along with you 10 times better, but you don't want to talk to that person either. And maybe there's somebody who sends you text messages every day and is more attentive to you and et cetera, but you don't want to talk to that person. Why are you actually attracted to the jerk? He said, well, maybe they have the right smell. I said that uh, ovulation and uh, hormonal status affects these processes. Another thing that affects these processes is fake smells. So you want to be attractive to somebody, you don't think they like you, you put in some perfume, some cologne, and now you have, uh, you have a better chance. It works partly because you're disguising <laughs> the, the actual smell of your body. So you're trying to select someone and you want to let your selfish genes tell you who is the better mate for you because they're gonna have, you're gonna have better children with that person, then ask that person not to wear any perfume, not to wear any cologne, et cetera, so that you can detect what they really smell like. So what does that mean? Let's talk back about the mice and the humans. What the hell does it mean to have a different MHC? What it means is the following. Imagine that your MHC 
stops certain things from entering your cells. For example, certain viruses. Your MHC detects the coronavirus. The coronavirus wants to get into your cells, but the MHC stops it, blocks it. So you have pretty good MHC because your MHC can do that. Somebody else has MHC that can do something that your MHC cannot do. Some other virus or a toxin or something has a potential of entering your cells, but that person's cell wall, because of their MHC, is uh, resistant. You have kids with that person, you end up having kids that have a mixture of your MHC molecules and the MHC molecules of the other person. The net result uh, for humans and mice is that uh, your kids are going to be healthier if you mate with people that have a very different MHC. In other words, your genes are going to live longer because they're going to be copied more because your kids are going to live longer because they're going to be healthier. Next in line. Um, uh, Ten years after Klaus Wedekind, we have zoologist Jan Havlicek of the Charles University in Prague doing somewhat similar experiments with men, women, and sweat. In this case, the test is different. Is there any way to correlate personality, your personality, with your sweat? In other words, when people are detecting and reacting to your sweat, is there any connection between your sweat and your personality? That's the question. Is there a connection between your sweat and your personality? So Havlicek gives a bunch of surveys to some men and asks them a series of questions. 48 men, uh, are you outgoing? Do you have a lot of friends? Um, are you the life of the party? Yeah, I am the life of the party. Now these men that have answered these questionnaires are told to wear cotton pads under their armpits. And these sweaty, nasty cotton pads are then inflicted on women who have chosen to participate in this perverse little experiment. The women now have to smell the sweaty cotton pads. And the question is, do you like this smell? What Havlicek finds, what he discovers, is that women actually like the smell of, um, uh, of men who have dominant personalities. The kind of guy who says, I'm the life of the party. I'm the obnoxious, outgoing, loudmouth, the leader of the pack, the, um, the organizer, the hub. That guy is attractive to women especially if the women are ovulating and especially if these women already have a partner. Why? Why the hell do women who have a partner like the stink of an obnoxious party guy who is kind of dominant? The theory that Jan Havlicek articulates is that perhaps in human evolution, it was a strategic advantage for women to find one man to settle down with, one man to raise their family with, that's the same man, one man who provides and builds a nest, it's the same man, but then go make babies with some other guy. So on the one hand, they, the claim is maybe this kind of uh, inborn ability is helping women find a guy who's going to be a good dad and also separately find a guy who's going to be a good uh, source of genes for the kids. Uh, is this true that, um, that it's actually happening? There have been studies with birds where scientists have found that 30% uh, 
of babies of birds that are mostly monogamous, 30% of their babies are actually from other parents, meaning that, that he's a female bird, she has a number of eggs, 30% of those eggs are from some, some male that is not her partner. Is that happening with humans? Our uh, percentage of us actually the son of some other guy who is not our dad, some other guy who is more outgoing than our dad and we don't even know it. Well, it's kind of illegal and inappropriate to test people. It's, it's rude to ask them. So, uh, hey, do you think your dad is really your dad? Um, hey, have you ever considered asking your dad to do, an e do a DNA test, a test, if he's really your dad? Maybe he isn't. I mean, your dad's kind of boring. Maybe your mom thought he was boring and he'd be a good supportive family father, but she went off to have babies with the, the, the quarterback in the football team. Maybe your mom fell in love with a quarterback but married your dad because your dad was a reliable provider. We don't ask that. So how the hell can we know? In hospitals, once in a while, because of genetic diseases, it's necessary to find the DNA of the parents, say the dad. Does the DNA of this father match the DNA of this kid? When they do these experiments, they find out you know, whether there are these matches. And they find, for example, that roughly 10% of uh, children are not the child of their dad. In other words, uh, Maury Povich comes along and he says, John, you are not the father in 10% of the cases. When they find this out, they don't tell the family, hey, we want you to know we were checking for this genetic illness, but don't worry, uh, it was not transmitted, but also your dad is not really your dad. They don't even tell the parents, but they know that this has happened. How does this affect behavior? It affects behavior in that scientific studies have shown that women are more likely to uh, get involved with someone who is not their partner during the period when they are most fertile. This seems to be a biological explanation for several things. Uh, infidelity, uh, polygamy, polyandry, etc. So on the one hand, you've got looks. You like someone because of the way they look. You like someone because of how smart they are, how funny they are, uh, how nice they are. You've got many factors, but it turns out that there are these invisible factors such as the smell of a person that are actually affecting your, your comments. We've got a question here from Mira. Do we know if other types of birth control like the implant patch IUD affect women's MHC attraction the way the pill seemed to? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm sure that uh, the patch and an implant will affect it in a similar way. The IUD, I just don't know. I just don't know. That's a great question. Gen Z says, my partner just said he read the book before. That's good. <laughs> All right. Why do people like each other? Another factor, height. Scientific studies have shown that women are generally more attracted to men if the men are at least four inches taller than the women on average. Age, scientific studies have found that women tend to pair up with men who are on average three and a half years older than themselves. So there's a, an evolutionary biologist at the University of Texas at Austin. His name is uh, David Buss. He tries to explain people's behavior people's psychology on the basis of ancient evolutionary history. Around 2011, he gives a series of surveys to 
more than 10,000 men and women worldwide in 37 countries. The surveys are trying to get at issues of physical attractiveness. Why do men like women? Uh, as I insinuated at the start of the class, the answer is not very mysterious. Men, for the most part, tend to like women based on physical appearance. How conventionally attractive is she? Um, uh, and also on youth. How young is this woman? Is she uh, young and attractive? Why young? Why does youth matter? One conjecture is that maybe it matters because uh, younger women are more fertile and or can have kids uh, for more years or something like that. But again, these are speculative evolutionary conjectures, assuming that these behaviors, I mean, the choice of women who are young is a trait that has been successful in uh, spreading the genes of particular men for hundreds of, or thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. What do women like? All right, we go to the chat. We go to the chat. He polled more than 10,000 people nationwide and uh, he asked, men and women, what do you like? Now, the problem, of course, is people are liars. So if I ask you, why do you like someone? It's very possible that you're just gonna lie because we all wanna be uh, something that uh, is not necessarily what we are. So we can't trust people. If I ask you, why do you like him? Oh, he's so nice. I like him because he's a nice guy. Tons of guys are nice. So, you know, why don't you like the other guys? Oh, he's just very nice. Is that really it? So, so we, we, you, can't, you can hardly get the truth out of people in a survey of this kind. So a, a more indirect way to ask the question, David Buss realizes, is you can ask people, what kind of partner, what kind of boyfriend, what kind of husband do you want for your daughter? What kind of partner, boyfriend, or husband do you want for your best female friend. For example, do you want a guy who is uh, homeless and unemployed and alcoholic? Is that what you want for your, for your partner? Or do you want somebody with a college degree? What kind of partner do you want? So, so the question I'm giving you all is what do you think people answered when in these many cultures they're asking, why do women what do women look for in a partner? What kind of men should, should women pair up with? Um, let's see, write me some suggestions. I'll read some of them. Why are women attracted to men? The answer is not uh, smell. I'm, I'm looking for the answer that people will give. So uh, Mira, for example, says uh, maybe women are attracted to men because of being uh, because of trust. Uh, Megan says maybe it's to whomever is nice. Daniela says safety and protection. Alexis, socioeconomic status. Jacob said intelligence, money, looks, humor, in that order. Emily uh, had asked a question about MHC. We'll pause on that. Jennifer says that her housemate said that uh, a good partner would be a rich one. Jasmine has a really good one, patient and responsible. You tell your daughter, I want you to find a man who is patient and responsible. Compatibility, Tracy. Natalia, someone who provides, protects, understanding, caring, and the list goes on. Protection shows up a lot. Uh, Varun, um, uh, Natalia, several people say protection. Alex says emotional intelligence. Michelle says a provider, someone with an education, similar socioeconomic status, similar background, say uh, a similar race, identity, religion, etc. Last suggestion. Marta says intelligent. That's the last one I'm taking now. So let's suppose, is that it? Is that what women are looking for? 
Marta, I want you to find an intelligent husband. That's what mothers tell their daughters. Is that what's actually happening? Or is it something else? It turns out that what, Davis, what David Buss finds is that most of these women give the following answers. It's two things. It's wealth and social status. In other words, a mother is telling her daughter, I want you to find a guy who's got a good job. I want you to find a guy who, uh, you know, just is great, prominent, interesting, or uh, this guy has good high social status. Like, I don't want you going out with a guy at the gas station. I don't want you going out with a guy at, at the movie theater who uh, breaks your ticket. I don't want you going out with the guy who drives the Uber. Instead, they want you to go out with some guy who's got, who makes a lot of money. This is different from what we found is what men are looking for. If men are looking for good looks and youth, it seems that women are looking for wealth and social status. Not all women. I don't want to insinuate or offend anyone. I'm sure many uh, women are not looking for that in particular. But uh, for the most part, this is what he finds and um, uh, it's significant for two reasons. One, it's different from what men are saying, but more dramatically, it's significant because there seems to be an agreement in all of these 37 cultures in multiple countries that David Buss analyzed. That's incredible. This is not what anybody would ask, expect. This is not what anybody would expect if you're an environmentalist, a behaviorist, or if you think that it's mostly nurture instead of genetics. If it's nurture, then what we expect is that in different cultures, there are different priorities. So in one culture, what really matters is I want you to find a man who is really devout and religious. In another culture, what really matters is I want you to find a man who is a good provider and makes a lot of money. In another culture, I want you to find a man who is respectful and who will love you forever. That's what we would expect. Instead, what David Buss found, which is completely, absolutely amazing, is that this preference for money and social status seems to be universal on this planet. That's incredible. When that happens, what biologists say is this is probably a biological thing. This is a biological preference. Now the question is why? Um, the question is why? Why would it be biological for women to choose a man that has more money and a better social status than another man? And here's a possible, plausible biological answer. Consider this example. This bird is known as a bowerbird. A bowerbird builds a nest and uh, uses the nest for uh, mating with a partner. The male builds the nest and a female bird arrives, looks at the nest, and decides if she likes it, if she wants to hang out at this nest, if she wants to settle down at this nest. In other words, it's known scientifically that the female bowerbirds are choosing their mates on the basis of the nest. The question in her choice for who is she gonna mate with is which bowerbird has built the more interesting, attractive nest. When I look at this nest, I don't know exactly what's at the bottom. There are these uh, colorful blue things. I don't know if those are little bits of flowers or if there are little bits of straw, plastic straw, but they contribute to this effect that this bird has created this cute little environment, this cute little home that gives the female the impression that this is a good mate. Sociobiology suggests, what if this is happening with humans? 
if it's happening with humans, then women are choosing men with money because that money is a symbol for something else, which is this guy can provide. This guy works hard. He can, uh, he's dedicated. He invests his effort and time on me. He, um, uh, he can take care of our kids. He is a protector. So many of the things that you guys were already bringing up in your suggestions are insinuated when we look at this model of um, why birds find one another attractive. Female preferences. They want men to be tall. They want men to be a little bit older. They want men to be a little bit or very wealthy. They want men to have a certain social status. Why do they matter? They matter because apparently these choices are uh, advantageous in terms of survival of the fittest, in terms of evolution. David Buss explains, women favor traits related to resources, good income, social status, education, intelligence, ambition, industriousness. Women favor more than men the traits uh, being kind and understanding, sociable, dependable, emotional stability, exciting personality, because these things seem to connect with social status. All right, that's all I've got. Now I'm going to uh, switch to uh, question and answer by beginning with some of the written questions. What I can add to this, if, if we look at birds again, then part of what's interesting is that even though the males are more colorful, the selection in the mating process is being driven by the women. The selection in the mating process, be, and the question becomes why? Why are the women the ones? Why the heck, why, why isn't it both? Why isn't it 50-50? And the answer that biologists give is, is the answer you gave, which is for the females, the uh, process of having children involves a commitment of time and sacrifice and uh, 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 nurturing that does not affect men nearly in the same way. So women have to face greater consequences for their choices, so they have to be more discriminating. They need to ensure that they can find a mate that will be more supportive. So, so the argument becomes that this is a biological thing. Because look, superficially, if we say, well, what are men looking for? Oh, men are looking for who is the young woman who is most attractive. Now we're gonna criticize men and we say, oh, you men are worthless, superficial, uh, just you know, guys who objectify women. And, and then we say, hey, yeah, men kind of are. Now we look at women and say, hey, women, what are you looking for? I'm looking for wealth and social status. And now we could criticize women and say, hey, women, you are uh, superficial, uh, money grubbing, et cetera. And then the answer is no, these are biological behaviors that have to do with survival. The woman is looking for social status because she's subconsciously at a genetic level discriminating in order to protect her offspring. She wants her offspring to survive we have a private question. The question is, did Darwin believe that polygamy was more advantageous than monogamy? I think the answer is yes, that Darwin thinks polygamy tends to generate more offspring, so it's better advantage, at least for men, for men, not necessarily for women. The idea that multiple caregivers for offspring allows for greater variation in resources If I have multiple caregivers, and one is a professor, another is a doctor, and another is a mechanic, being cared for and taught by these caregivers would give me more knowledge and therefore greater survival than someone raised by only two caregivers. Um, yeah, this goes back to what we were talking in the class about Dawkins and sociobiology. It goes back to group selection. In other words, you can have a society in which what matters is not just your partner, 
but a whole support system around you, your community, your relatives, in the examples you give, doctor, professor, mechanic, a community of people who have enough altruism to help you. Definitely, that's, that's important. Sastry, if cultural norms exist universally, do they become biological norms? What the sociobiologists are saying is yes. Certain things that we used to call cultural norms have been mislabeled. They are really biological. That's what they're saying. Daniel, what about in arranged marriages? Does he discuss this situation? Uh, yes. Yes, David Buss discusses that. In arranged marriages, the preferences are the same. The parents want their daughter to marry a man who has a good social status. For example, if you're in India and you're getting an arranged marriage, they want someone that will marry their daughter that is of the same social class, not a lower social class. They absolutely categorically do not want a husband from a lower social class. And uh, do they want someone with wealth? Yes, they prefer a partner who can provide for their daughter. Irving, would time, place, manner of human interaction also affect the attractiveness of men to women? Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. Time, place, manner, interactions you have with individuals are very important in who ends up pairing up with who. The question is, can we measure it? Can we measure whether that great conversation you had at the 7-Eleven is more important than somebody's smell? That can only be answered by some sort of experiment. Uh, in other words, you don't choose to have sex with anyone that provides great conversation. It could be a great friend, you love your friend, you have great conversations, but you just don't wanna have sex with your friend. Erica, do these ideas connect somehow to step-parents and who the children consider their true parent? I think the answer is that the, in the case of David Buss, the, what the parents want for their kids is the same, whether their kids are biological kids or their kids are adopted kids. They want the same, which is they want their kids to marry someone with, with a good income and good social status. I'm uh, unmuting everybody. If anybody has more questions, please write them. If anybody has to leave, 